Please take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And we'll begin our reading at verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 31, beginning at verse 11. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. When all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and they may learn and fear the Lord thy God and observe to do all the words of this law, and that their children which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land whither you go over Jordan to possess it. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. A preacher never should say anything new. The Word of God is very old. Anything new or novel is, is an error. Everything that is taught or preached that is true to the Bible is old information. And if you've been around for a while, if you've known the Lord and heard some, some, some decent stuff from the pulpit, if you've had somebody that was sticking to the Word of God, you've probably heard everything that I'm going to tell you before. When I was in college, I had a lot of fun. Lifelong friendships were made. Concerts, sporting events were attended. A lot of dating going on by God's providence. He provided me with my wonderful wife. All sorts of things happened in those years. But they were not and end in and of themselves. I know some people live that way, but that isn't what the purpose is. They're, they're designed for preparation. Now, we often think of the church as a, as a place of ministry, and it is. There's a lot of people that serve here in various capacities. Lots of ministry goes on. But like college, it's not an end in and of itself. You come here to get trained. You come here to be educated. You come here to be, be equipped for ministry. It's what we do when we, we leave, frankly, that matters the most. Each of us is entering a world filled with ministry opportunities. Life is ministry, folks, for everybody. For everybody who knows Christ as Savior, life is ministry. That's what it's supposed to be. Each one of us has talents, opportunities that no one else has. God has entrusted you with these things. Divine appointments are, are given to us. What are we doing with them? You will meet people. You have interactions on a regular basis with people I will never meet. You are the, the best Christian that a number of people know. If something were to come up in their lives, if they have questions to ask, you are the go-to person for them, whether you like it or not. Are we dutiful students learning how best to serve the master? Are we busy doing the work of the ministry in the time, place, and with the tools God has given Peter in our, our text, and, and frankly the whole book here, is in essence saying, remember what you know and be what you are. I know that sounds somewhat redundant, but that's what he's saying. Because we are experts at forgetting. And so this book is all about reminding. He says in verse 12, wherefore... I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. What things? The things he's talked about in the first 11 verses. He deals with our salvation. He deals with the things that we are to do with that salvation. Put you in remembrance of these things. Though you know them, you already, you've already heard all this. You know this, but we need to be, we need to be reminded. And to be established in the, in the present truth. 
We are, and you hear this all the time from me, you need to know why you believe what you believe. We are inundated with theological errors in the Sunday School or hour I talked about TBN. I'm going to tell you the vast majority of what you hear on that is a bunch of nonsense. There's always a little bit of truth mingled in that. That's what makes it dangerous. But there's a lot of error mingled in there. We need to be students of the Word. When I was in college, I had, one of my favorite professors did this. We're, he was, I think it was teaching Corinthian epistles. And I can't remember where in the books that this occurred. But, and, the, and the classroom was about the size of this room, and it was packed because he's a very popular teacher. People wanted to sign up for his classes. And he got up there, and about, we had him, for, the classes were, were 50 minutes. And about 20 minutes into the, into the lecture, this is a, a full semester class, about, about 20 minutes into the lecture, he starts teaching heresy. And he goes on, and he starts digging the hole a little bit deeper, and, he, and, he's, and he, he's, he's waxing eloquent, teaching overt error. And in this classroom with probably 80 or 100 students, initially you had a couple of people just stop and start staring at him. And then after a minute or two, you got a bunch of guys, they're standing there with their arms folded, with their heads cocked like this. But you always had, you had a bunch of people that were dutifully taking down notes. And after two or three minutes of this, he says, all right, folks, stop. And I want you to go back up to where I started, and he tells us what, and says, and put a big X through your notes of everything I've said since that point. And congratulations to those that you, who noticed when that happened and paused and began to look at me. And I dare say that if I'd gone on too much longer, some of you probably would have stood up and either walked out of the room or accosted me at, right up here at the front of the class. And shame on the rest of you for not noticing. And then he explained to the class what, what he had done and why. And it's this same point. We need to know why we believe what we believe and be able to tell the difference. Don't be enamored by some preacher or teacher. Oh, I got this favorite guy. I love his books. Or he said that he's just so great about this. And I'm going to tell you that everybody has their idiosyncrasies. I probably have some too. You're going to come up to me afterwards and say, oh, by the way, I, this is your idiosyncrasy, and they're going to point out, and everybody else is going to have a different, one, different perspective of what that one is. We need to study the Scripture on our own. If your daily, if your intake of Scripture knowledge takes place on Sundays at Grace Baptist Church, you are malnourished. You are not getting enough. You need to read and study the Scripture on your own. I strongly recommend that you start by having a quality study Bible. Emphasize the word quality, underline that about four or five times, because there's a lot of junk out there. I remember when I was in, in seminary and as a, as a youth pastor and so on, I, 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 my wife will tell you this, I grieved, go, this is back before, uh, before Amazon. So this is really, we, we took our horse and buggy to the store. And, and I would grieve over the Christian bookstores. They were full of junk. You go to the Bible study section, and it was this little skinny thing with a, with a few random basic tools and uh, maybe a few things that probably shouldn't have been there anyway. And then the whole rest of it was filled on, quote, unquote, Christian living. And this section dealing with this and this. And it was, it was a bunch of garbage for the most part. And yet, that was what was the Christian bookstore was filled with. Now, that tells you something right there. Why was the store filled with a bunch of junk? Because that's what people are reading and studying. They are filling their mind with a bunch of light, they're, they're eating marshmallows. And we need to know what God's Word says. Occasionally guilty here, but I'm going to tell you, and, and I've got access to things, but I'm telling you that, that you need to look up, the question, look up the answers to the questions that you come across when you're reading your Bible. 
Most of you are probably regularly reading the scripture, hopefully on a daily basis. And when you come across something that you don't understand, if you have a study Bible, you will glance down and see if there's a note on that particular thing, which hopefully there is. That's one of the reasons you have a study Bible, and the reason the notes are there is to deal with the, the questions. But if there is not an answer, here is the, the standard response. Huh. And then you go on. The shrug of the shoulders is the answer to the question. One of the things that I tell people to do, you have a great benefit here at Grace. And it isn't just me. There are people here that you can ask questions. If you come across something you don't understand in your Bible, ask. I get people that will text me or send me an email and they feel guilty. That's what I'm for, okay? Ask the questions. Christian Perry, who will be here tonight almost certainly, is always peppering me with questions. I love it. I love it. And some of his questions are deep, and I love that. That means he is studying and he's thinking. And he's doing research and he is, he is studying and he's wanting to understand. Here's what I tell people to do. When you're reading your Bible, and by the way, I know some people read it on your phone and that's all good and fine. Have a copy that you can write things in the margins and underline verses and things of that nature. They make actually wide margin Bibles that you can scribble all kinds of notes in here. And as you're reading your Bible, don't use the fancy silk you know, bookmark or the one that has the nice quaint little saying, you know, footprints or something like that. Uh, you know, you, you, want, you want to have the, and, and my, I've, got, I've, got, I've got two ribbon markers in my Bible. You know, they come with a ribbon marker. Don't use that. I mean, if you want to, go ahead. But, but use something in addition, at least. Use a 3 by 5 card. Why would I use a 3 by 5 card? Because when you come across the passage that you don't understand, write down the reference and the question. And then when you're here again, you'll have your Bible with you and the bookmark and the question. Ask the question. One of the things I... I, I as a, as a younger pastor, when the service was over, I was tired, and I still am. I'm still tired at the end of the service. And so I would look at the clock. I'm not encouraging you to do that right now. And I would say, all right, let's, let's hope this place clears out in a hurry because I want to go home. And I have learned that that is wrong-headed thinking. Because the reality is the longer people hang out and talk, that's a good sign of a healthy church. They want to talk to each other. They're fellowshipping. Uh, the young guys here especially, they're asking Bible questions and talking about ministry and things. And that's good. That's a great opportunity to ask your question. But we need to know why we believe what we believe. <clears throat> Get answers to those questions. Look it up. And by the way, be careful. <clears throat> One of the things I was, I was uh, talking about in the Sunday school hour, as far as uh, when John the Baptist said, uh, he shall baptize with, with, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That there's, the commentators have at least five interpretations of that passage. Be careful. There's a lot of very strange things out there. And always be careful in your, in your Bible study. Be discerning. Errors are very often close to the truth. Little errors have big, big implications. We talked about this last Sunday night with uh, the, the, the wrong interpretation of two verses at the end of Daniel chapter 8. That wrong interpretation created Seventh-day Adventism and everything that goes with it. Because if, if their interpretation is right here, then, then that means this, and then that means this, and then that means this. But they were wrong in the first place. And it created this whole avalanche of error that became, came about because they, they misunderstood a fairly simple passage. And the original misinterpretation was based on wishful thinking. They wanted something to be. 
and it had to do with date calling, you know, the idea that Jesus is coming on this date. We know it because it says here in the Bible. Yeah, but it also says in the Bible that we don't know. And so if you think you know because of this, but over here it says you don't know, that means that you're missing out on, on your first one. Because we don't know. And yet that wishful thinking created an avalanche of error. Little errors have great implications. Know the difference. Know the difference between truth and error. How do you do that? You know the truth so well that when error happens, or when you see it, or you read it, it's evident. When I was in college, I, uh, I was involved for a semester in a ministry that went to the downtown area of, uh, of this town, which was fairly nice set up there. There was a lot of shops and so on down there. And we would go out down there and we would pass out tracts and we would try to engage people in conversation and, and do some, uh, some personal evangelism. And I started talking to this guy and he started mocking what I was, what I was saying. And so I said, well, what do you believe? And so I kept asking him questions, and I, because I didn't know, he, he told me he was, and I'm not going to mention what it was, I've since learned a little bit more about it, but he told me what he was, and I, I didn't know anything about it. And so I started asking him questions, and I was learning what, what he taught, and what he believed, and, and by knowing the truth, at least to some degree, I could see where he was in error. It was a learning experience for me. But it also gave me an opportunity to come back and be able to answer his errors from the Bible. Know the truth so well that when error shows up, even if you're not familiar with the error, it stands out because it's in contradiction to what you know to be true from God's Word. There needs to be that familiarity. He says, he says that you know them, though you know them. There is a familiarity. These people that, were, that, uh, that Peter is addressing had been well taught. They had probably heard Peter. Many of them, we're going to find out, had, had heard Paul. They had the best of teachers. They already knew. They'd heard it all before. They had paid attention. If I were to... Uh, at the close of the service, pass out a five or six question quiz. Would you pass? If it's just based on, on what I'm saying today, would you pass? Are you, are you paying attention? Because I know from experience that the devil is not over here at the, at the bar. He's not over here at the, the place where they're, they're, they're mocking the scripture. He's not over, over here at the, the place of prostitution. He's not over here at the drug den. Those things take care of themselves. He's here in church. His minions are in church. Their, their job is to distract. Their job is to confuse. Their job is to keep people from understanding the word of God. It's amazing how often a fire truck goes by or an ambulance goes by or a police car, some kind of siren goes off at the most critical point of a sermon. It's absolutely amazing how often that happens. Now this little one is very quiet, but I'm going to tell you also that one of the jobs of demons is to pinch babies during the service. I'm just telling you that, that that's another one that, 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 that happens. That, that we are to be distracted. And so we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention to what we're reading. When we read the Bible, very often we just drag our eyes across the page because it's our daily duty, our daily expectation. I have filled that, fulfilled that duty. I have checked that box. I'm good to go. What did you read today? I don't know. If you were to take a quiz on, on the Bible passage that you read earlier this morning, if you did, would you pass? You have to think about, what book am I reading anyway? What book of the Bible am I in? What was going on? What, what was being taught in this passage? I, I don't know. I don't remember. Either because we weren't paying attention or we're really, really, really good at forgetting. I need to be able to pass along information. We do that in personal evangelism. 
It's, it's amazing. Some of the best opportunities for evangelism don't take place here. The best opportunities for personal evangelism are the divine appointments that God get, brings across our path during the, during the course of the week. Somebody comes across, us across our path, we get into a conversation, that's your opportunity. Most people that I know did not get saved in a church service, especially if they got saved when they were adults. They got saved through the, 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 the interaction with, with somebody, a relative, a friend that they had talked to. Sometimes a series of those things. But it's through the influence of a, of a particular individual or two. We need to make sure that we are those people. We start by telling our story. Now here's a, here's a question. Do you, do you have a story? I know some people are great storytellers. If you don't have a personal story about your salvation experience, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. If I were to ask you, tell, tell me how, how you came to know Christ. Tell me your story. Do you have a story to tell? It's, uh, I, I hear a lot of these. Interviewing people for baptism and so on. I, I hear these stories. Some of them are great and thrilling. Some of them are pretty, pretty basic, but some of them are really thrilling and exciting. What God did to bring that person to, to a place of faith in himself. Do you have a story? And it doesn't have to be super dramatic, but do you have a story to tell? And if you do, you need to review that. I, used to tell, I encourage this. Write it out. I had a Bible study with a guy who had all the right answers as far as the gospel was concerned. He, I'm born again, I got saved, and he talked about when he was a child and so forth. And I said, we were covering this very thing, and I said, well, what we need to do is, is you need to be able to share your story. So what, when you get, you know, sometime until, until next time we meet, I want you to write out your story. And as he sat down to begin to write out his story, it came to the realization, I don't have one. I have all the right answers. I have the knowledge and I believe the knowledge to be true, but I have personally never trusted Christ as a Savior. And so sitting there in front of his computer, because he was getting ready to type out his story, he got saved. Know your story so that you can share that with other people. You are an eye... We talk about witnessing. The Bible is God's Word. And as I preach God's Word, I am giving a second-hand piece of information. God didn't speak to me directly as the penman for the, for the Scripture. Now, God speaks to me from this book, true. But when I share my testimony, I'm giving a first-hand account. I am truly witnessing because I am an eyewitness, an ear witness of what God has done in me. So know that story. And have scriptural authority to back it up. You have to have Bible verses. Do I have... Church directory. Most of us occasionally grab this because you know, we have phone numbers plugged into our phones these days. But uh, in the back of this, there's a tool. Verses for evangelism. Oh, I, I don't know what to say. It's all right here. We cover this information from time to time here. We remind you. But it's here too. Know these verses. Know these verses. If you grew up in church, if you were a child in church, sometime when you were little, you memorized these. The file is still there somewhere in the back of your head. You just got to pull it out, shake out, blow the dust off it, and review these things from time to time. But know these. Because when you're sharing your story, the authority, now your story is, is important, but the authority, the power is in the Word of God. Know the verses. Be able to share the gospel. Because our job, one of the things in the Great Commission is to make disciples. I need to be able to tell the gospel story to other people. And then also we need to, to teach other believers. There are lots of people that you know. There are Christians that you know that you are the, the sharpest tool in the box in their circle. 
you are the most trained Christian in certain circles of believers. You are, I mentioned the go-to pe person for, for people with spiritual questions. Sometimes that's true for, for other believers too. That's you. You're the person they're going to ask the questions of. Are you capable of discipling somebody else? Are you capable of teaching and training somebody else the basics of the Christian faith? You need to be. You need to be. You need to teach people about their Christian responsibilities, how we are to live, that we are to be possess those tools necessary for the Christian life. Look at verses, starting at verse 5. Beside this, giving all diligence to add to your faith virtue, that's moral excellence, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance or self-control, to temperance patience or perseverance, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity or love, Christian love. We need to be able to tell people what these are. We need to be able to tell people how to put these things into action. We need to be living them ourselves. If I have a, 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 enough of a handle on these things, so I'm implementing these things in my life, I should be able to convey this to other people as well. Putting these things into action, Christian qualities, the things that we ought to be, and what we are to believe. Because the reality is that as we win people and teach them and train them, we are hopefully discipling future disciplers. We are passing the baton. We are preparing the next generation, which is biblical. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Paul says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I need to win other people to Christ. I need to train them, teach them, disciple them so that they can do the same thing. Years ago, a friend of mine had his first grandchild. And he was telling me after he had gone to see this grandchild and got to hold this grandchild and, and so on, he says, you know, I'm, I'm a father. But there, oh, to be a grandfather. Oh, and he was just in awe of, of being a grandfather. Just, oh, this is, the greatest, this is the greatest thing in my life is to be a grandfather. I remember as a teenager, a fellow named Jeff, first guy I ever led to the Lord. I'm telling you, when he, when he got saved, I was, I was just floating. I was so excited. But you know what's even more exciting than winning somebody to Christ? It's when you see spiritual grandchildren. That somebody that you led to Christ, somebody that got saved through whatever ministry that you have, because you do have one, that they grew and matured in Christ, and they led someone to Christ. I'm telling you, that's exciting. That is seeing 2 Timothy 2.2 2 in play. That is a thrilling thing. Spiritual children are wonderful. Spiritual grandchildren, woohoo! And we ought to have some of those. We ought to have spiritual children. Look back at your Christian life. I know some of you haven't been saved super long, but if many of you have been saved for decades. Can you look back at your, at your Christian life and say, are there, is there anybody, is there anybody that I've led to Christ? Even if it's, you know, children in a children's ministry, that counts. Because they got their whole lives ahead of them. What was it, the story D.L. Moody said that, uh, how many got saved at the last meeting? Two and a half. And somebody thought it was two adults and a child. It's the exact opposite, two children and an adult. Because the adults, his life's half gone already. Children have their whole lives ahead of them. Have you ever led someone to Christ? In this day and age, I'm telling you, people aren't as receptive. But you know what? Some people get saved. Some people get saved. We need to be the voice. We need to be the spokesman. We need to be the people that are sharing that news. We need to be producing reproducers. You win somebody to Christ, you train them, you disciple them, 
And by the grace of God, they're going to start doing what you had done in the first place to bring them to the place of, of faith. And we have a commission to do this. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, our Lord said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That word teach, the first time it occurs there, means make disciples. Make disciples. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Teaching, that second teach is a different word. That's the word for discipleship. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We have a, a commission to do this. It isn't just for the preachers. I'm telling you, the ministry works a whole lot better through multiplication than addition. You know, if you, if you only in your whole life led two people to Christ and trained them and taught them and they led two people to Christ, if that was the standard approach for everybody who's truly born again, the whole world would have, been, would, would, have been, would have been saved hundreds and hundreds of years ago. If believers would simply, in their lifetime, not only replace themselves, but add one and teach and train them so that they would do the same. It isn't that I'm going to have a, a whole bucket. It's, I have known people that were amazing soul winners. They, were, they, were just, they were just had a great gift in this ability. But it's a responsibility for all of us. We need to be sharing the gospel with others. Verse 13. He says, Yea, I think it meet or appropriate, as long as I am in this tabernacle. He's referring not to the, the tent that he was staying in, but rather the body he lives in. To stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Seems to be fixated on the idea of reminding people. And he also is, is acknowledging that as long as I'm in this body, I have no intention of retiring. As long as I am alive, I will do this. To some degree, to some extent, as long as I'm alive, I will do this. Because he says, short, short, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. I need to, it's appropriate for me to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Earlier we sang, tell me the old, old story. I had been saved for about two years. I got saved reading a gospel tract. I was saved for two years before I heard a preacher preach the gospel that I can remember. And because it was going to be another couple of years before I got into a church where I was taught and discipled. It would be later on, matter of fact, uh, several months after I heard that, that sermon from the pulpit, different church. And I'm telling you, when I heard the gospel from the pulpit, I thought it was the greatest sermon I'd ever heard in my whole life. I was, I was 16 when I heard that sermon. I had, at that point in my life, heard hundreds of sermons. I'd been dragged off to church since I was in diapers. And it was the most, it was a memorable sermon. If you give it, Sparks was the guy's name. Last name was Sparks. He was a missionary to Argentina. I still remember that. It was in Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. He, was, he wore glasses, and he was losing his hair. I remember this. It stood out to me, but it, but it wasn't what, it, what the guy looked like and what he did. It was the message he gave. The gospel. I had been a believer for two years. It was old news. He didn't tell me anything I, I hadn't since learned on my own. But it was thrilling to hear. The old should always be fresh. We should never grow weary of hearing, neither should we grow weary of telling. 
there is something thrilling. I am old enough to remember, because people do it differently now. I don't have, remember when billfolds had that little section with the transparent pieces and the foot pictures in here? See, these days, we do this. We whip it out, and we go through the, oh, let me, let me show you the pictures of my children or my grandchildren. And they, and, and they start showing off, and they blow it up, and you can see the expression on the face. Oh, this is, oh, oh, isn't that darling? I have a picture of this little one. And so we, we look at these things, and, and years from now, when he's running around and being a little vandal. <laughs> I used to call my kids thieves and vandals when they were little. Because they were. Um, that we still are in love with our children. And we talk about our children. And we, if I, if I, uh, if I get to, if I talk to, um, uh, the guys are different. It's the ladies that do this mostly. I was talking to my, I talked to my brother, David, this past week for, for probably 45 minutes or an hour. And so my wife's first question is, how's the family? <laughs> I know, we talk shop. He's a pastor too. Not too many guys you can talk shop about with, uh, as far as the ministry is concerned. But we, we, we keep up on the family thing. We do most of the time. It's something we talk about. The kids are grown. He talks about his grandkids now. By the way, he wasn't the same guy I was talking about that had his first grandchild, although he was excited too. It shouldn't grow old. We shouldn't grow weary of telling. And the basic truths that we believe need to be constantly reviewed. This is why here at Grace Baptist Church, every four or five years, I cover basic theology. I either do it in the Sunday school hour or deal it with the evening service. One of these days I'm going to do it in the morning service as a series. Because we need to be reminded why we believe what we believe. Because even people who have been here for a long time, when I, I get this, especially when I'm dealing with the, that particular thing. I get some of this. The mouth hangs open. The eyes get big. They've been coming here for six, seven, eight years. They've heard that series before. What happened? They forgot. Or they weren't here that day. Or whatever the case, but they probably forgot. Or they were daydreaming. Something was going on. They weren't paying attention during that, that, that little blip where they heard this before. And then you get the... Oh, that's why. Okay, all right, now I understand. I get a lot of that. It's fun being on this side looking at because you look at the backs of each other's heads. I get, the, I get the expressions. And when something clicks, it's like... Basic truths need to be constantly reviewed. We forget. A, by the way, a skill that, we, 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 that improves with age. <laughs> Forgetting. This is why even when we were young, we studied for exams. We'd heard it in class. Theoretically, we were taking notes. We had a textbook. Theoretically, we were reading that too. But why is it that we always studied before the exam? Because... We forgot, and we needed to review. We also have a tendency to minimize things. We realize that some things are important after the fact. <laughs> the same professor that I was talking about that preached, uh, that was uh, started teaching the heresy to make a point, teaching Corinthian epistles. In chapter 1, and I believe it's verse 17, Paul says, for, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And therefore, baptism is not part of the gospel. I am saved apart from baptism. If, if baptism saves me, then that would be part of Paul's, Paul's, uh, Paul's job, but it's not his job. He had other people do the baptizing. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So those who teach that baptism saves, that is a great verse to refute that position. As a matter of fact, 
we had somebody saved when I preached on that because they had been trusting their baptism and all of a sudden the lights came on. It was one of those <gasps> moments and realized he'd been trusting in his baptism apart from Christ. Well, the fellow's in his classroom and the, and the professor's teaching on this and that night at work, the guy was confronted by a Church of Christ preacher and he didn't have an answer. But he was being taught, he was taught that day. Yes, but he wasn't paying attention. And the next day in class, he's busy taking his notes and he went up to the professor afterward and asked, now what was that thing there? I want to make sure, and he told him the story and that's how I know it. We minimize, we, we don't pay attention. We often exchange good for the best, or the best for good. We put things off. Plans are unfulfilled. Oh, I need to go witness to so-and-so. Oh, I need to invite so-and-so. Oh, I need to talk to them. And we, and we never do it. How many people do you pray for that you have never shared the gospel with? And you have opportunity. Might be somebody that's out of the area. I understand that. But how many people that you pray for on a regular basis, and that you could talk to them or email them or whatever the case may be, and you've never done it. You've prayed for them, you've prayed for them, you've prayed for them, you've never talked to them. We've got good intentions, that's why I'm praying. My follow-through is the, the problem. See, we procrastinate our, our spiritual responsibilities. We have the, I'll get to that, or one of these days kind of things. I should do that, and we acknowledge that, and we, we, never, get, we never get to it. And so he says in verse 15, <coughs> Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, that word decease is the word exodus, after my departure. Hey, by the way, that's not a standard word for, for, for death anywhere in the Bible or in, in Greek uh, literature. Think about this. Going back to, to, to the book of Exodus, they were going from Egypt to Canaan. They were going from slavery to liberty. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. My exodus. He's not in fear. He's in anticipation. And he knows how he's going to die, and it's not going to be pleasant. But he is in anticipation of what lies ahead. After my exodus, I won't be able to talk to you folks anymore. So you need to pay attention right now. Because I'm leaving. God told me, I'm leaving. These are the, the last words of a dying man. He is sharing what is most important to other believers. And it isn't anything new. It's, it's reminders. He's reminding them. And this is a guy who should know what is most important. That we, it's what we are to believe and what we are to do. These things ought to be second nature. As a Christian, it's what I am to believe. It is what I do. These are the things that ought to characterize us. Now, you have heard, I didn't tell, tell you anything today other than maybe a couple of stories. I haven't told you anything today that you haven't heard before. You've heard it all before. It's old information. And you may say, I've, I've heard it all before. You may even say, I, I remember. I remember. I know all these things. If you were to ask me about these things, I could tell you. I could, I could have said everything that you said today. So are you doing it? Do you believe it? And are you doing it? Because... He says we need, to be, we need to be reminded, and it's true. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these last words from a dying man. 
to the children of God who, who need to be reminded. We need to remember. We need to have these things refreshed. And Father, we need to be busy doing it. May we not lose track. May we not delay. May we not get distracted. Father, may we focus on the task at hand and be what we're supposed to be and do what we're supposed to do. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's stand for